I had to work the next morning. So I was trying to like, you know, catch up on my sleep. It was like 3 a.m. Asian time. And they were like, oh, are there any volunteers or doctors on the plane? So I raised my hand and they were like, yeah, you know, this lady just has a little bit of abdominal pain. I think she just has some gas. Can you come and see her? The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians. The American College of Physicians is thrilled to announce its first National Internal Medicine Day being held on October 28th. You can visit www.acponline.org forward slash I am proud for further details. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. Hi, Paul. No, you're not Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back to The Curbsiders. Hi, Matt. The Internal Medicine Podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. For your brain hole. I'm Matt Watto, here with my co-hosts, Dr. Paul Williams and Dr. Stuart Brigham. Hey, how you doing, Matt? Matt? What's Matt? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> What's happening? Matt, Stuart, great to see you. <laughs> oh, okay. It's good to see you too, Paul. So, or hear you. <laughs> I think we have yet another very valuable episode for the listeners here. We are talking about in-flight emergencies, and we are talking with Angelica Zen, who is an internal medicine and pediatrics uh, trained resident. She did med peds at UCLA, and she is currently the chief resident of internal medicine there. The reason we were talking with her is because she responded to an in-flight emergency and is a hero. And you'll hear more about that here in a little bit. Yeah. And, uh... We get into a lot of the practicalities of practicing in the austere environment uh, of a plane, of a plane flight, and I think it's going to be really helpful to you if you ever find yourself in that environment, because we'll tell you what we would do and what's available. That's right, I think. So, uh, without further ado, here is our discussion with Angelica Zen. I don't have anything witty to say this time, I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay. Oh, wait, no, I got it. And off we go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. I know that. Uh, I know that hurts. Our guest today is Angelica Zen. She is the chief resident at UCLA for the internal medicine program, and we will be talking about in-flight emergencies. Hi, Angelica. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thanks. We we are happy to have you on the show because uh, I hear that you are much more heroic than myself, or probably my colleagues. I don't want to. I don't want to speak for Paul and Stewart, but I don't think they've uh, ever saved anybody before. So, um, <laughs> thanks, Matt. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Just not in flight, maybe. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so we like to, uh, before we talk about the in-flight stuff, I do, I do want to just do these, uh, kind of some rapid fire questions and, uh, your, your answers don't have to be rapid fire, but, uh, we'll, we'll ask you some rapid fire questions and then we'll move on to the main part of the show. Okay. Okay. All right. So what is a great book that you would recommend to our listeners? Um, well, I really loved how doctors think by Jerome Groupman. Ah. I think probably most people have read that already. Um, but I had a physician I shadowed in college who gave it to me before I went to medical school and he was like, you know, there's some lessons in this book that have all stayed with me and I totally agreed with them. I feel like it teaches you a lot about cognitive errors and, you know, the problems of, you know, making decisions based off of heuristics and the cognitive biases we make. So it's a book that I kind of reference a lot. So I, I think you mentioned the one book that I've read that Matt has not read. I have not That's read right. that book. That's <laughs> right. I've got that one. Thank you so much for actually making my day. This is Stuart. Stuart's, Stuart has made fun of me the past like five or six podcast episodes because I have not asked people for book recommendations and I'm obsessed with getting book recommendations. And you so, finally mentioned one. That, so thank you. That and I agree with and have read. If the rest of this show is terrible, it has been successful because you it's, gave a good book recommendation. You've made my day. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you it. What is your favorite medical app, something like an Hippocrates? 
Um, well, I personally use MedCalc probably the most because <laughs> I can't remember any of the formulas. Um, but I also really like uh, AHRQ, you know, the one that gives you di- get guidelines on like USPS TF recommendations. Um, yeah, but use up to date definitely a lot as well. Yeah, Matt always forgets the winter's formula. It's okay though. <laughs> <laughs> Be, being a chief resident is for sure uh, stressful. So what, what kind of things are you doing to promote wellness in your life? Yeah, um, well, I personally, I like being outside a lot and I like uh, working out. So we definitely like doing some beach volleyball, kind of combine some sunshine and some physical activity. Um, but that's probably our favorite thing to do on the weekends. Really like going to farmer's market and yeah, just staying active. Paul, you do a lot of beach volleyball in Philadelphia? I think it does. <laughs> it's almost exclusively. It's my <laughs> medicine suffering as a result. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we, we mentioned that you're busy. What are you doing to stay current with the evidence? And, and how can you, how do you suggest our listeners do so? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just reading in small bits as you can, just learning on the go, like when you see a patient with something you don't know, looking that up. Um, But I personally really like Physicians First Watch, too. Do you guys um, have that? Um, It's like an email that goes out every morning kind of telling you, like, the latest evidence on from, like, any JM or JAMA. So I'll, like, look at it in the morning or look at it in the bathroom or something. Uh, Yeah. Is is that a a great way to see her? Is that a paid resource? Wait, wait, no, 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 no. More importantly, you're looking at this in the bathroom. (laughs) Yeah, there's no time. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Keep your phone away from me. (laughs) Probably see dip on it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So they kind of look at all the different journals. They'll look at like the major articles that are being published. Um, but it sends you, it's very similar. They'll send you like a summary of all the major headline or major set, major headlines at the top. Um, and then at the bottom, they'll give like a brief, like one to two sentences summary of each study. So, but it's free to everyone, which is different than um, Journal Watch. Right. So, so Matt's paying for the next level yep. and he didn't even know about this. Yep. Uh, I, I am taking money away from my kid's college fund to pay for <laughs> New England Journal Watch. I, I, I got to say, you, Angelica, you were absolutely making my day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have so much to boast about tomorrow on the mat. Yes. Making me look stupid is a big part of why Stuart likes doing the show. That's right. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not nice. Matt, you're my friend. <laughs> Paul and Stuart, I wanted you guys to help me remind the audience that this October 28th, 2019 is the first ever annual National Internal Medicine Day, which basically celebrates the awesomeness of internal medicine Stuart, did you want to tell us why you personally are proud to be an internist? I know you have strong feelings about it. You've dedicated your life to this practice Look, and Matt. to raising five kids and lots and lots of pets. <laughs> Look, Matt, I'm, I'm proud to be an internal medicine physician, mainly because I get to do so many things, make an impact in so many people's lives. And frankly, I, I, I wouldn't choose another career. I really do love what I do. And I, I can't say that strongly enough. I like educating. I like training. And frankly, I just love medicine. Yeah. I mean, the guy's working like 2.5 FTEs, Paul. Clearly, he loves his job. <laughs> I'm just picturing him sitting on a chair backwards with his baseball cap turned around, just talking <laughs> to the kids, really just getting real with them about internal medicine. Okay. So, uh, Paul, why don't you tell people how they can enter the ACP's I Am Proud contest? And they should enter by October 28th because they can be eligible for the first rise of, round of prizes. We are asking you to flood the internet with your internal medicine pride so you can tell a story, recognize a colleague or mentor, just in general, spread your love for internal medicine, um, like Stuart, um, get real with the kids and be sure right. to tag <laughs> at ACP internist and use the hashtags, hashtag I am proud and hashtag national internal medicine day on social media. Submit a form online to tell why you're I am proud for a chance to win prizes. For further details, go to www.acponline.org forward slash I am proud. All right, uh, let's let's move into the main topic here, Angelica. Oh, that wasn't it, <laughs> Angelica? How was your honeymoon? And uh, did anything exciting happen? Uh, maybe on the return flight. Um, so we were in Bali, but we had a connecting flight through, flight through Taiwan. So our flight was from Taiwan to LA, um, and they basically just told like we were sleeping on the plane. I was I had to work the next morning, so I was trying to like you know catch up on my sleep. It was like three a.m. Asian time, and they were like oh, are there any volunteers or doctors on the plane? So I raised my hand and they were like, yeah, you know, this lady just has a little bit of abdominal pain. I think she just has some gas. Can you come and see her? I was like, sure. Um, were there yeah. any other respondents or was it just you? 
No, it's just me. I think everyone is pretty much passed out. Um, so it's unclear if there were any other healthcare providers. They announced it a couple of times and no one else volunteered. And so. Was the woman obviously pregnant when you saw her? No. Yeah. She, it, 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 it happened in the interim, Matt. <laughs> I, I, I thought that you weren't really supposed to fly if you're like heavily pregnant. She, or, it was, I shouldn't say was, heavily. I just was, mean like if you're very pregnant. This was through Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're totally right. She was actually, um, so she actually had a blanket over her. Uh, so I'm not sure if like the flight attendants had looked at her. Um, so maybe they didn't know she was pregnant because they definitely did not include that in their sign out mm. to me yeah. <laughs> as they were walking over. Um, she's got a blanket so. and some gas. That's it. That's all we have. Yeah. Exactly. Because you, like, oh, you, you always get a doctor for gas. <laughs> yeah. So what happened? Tell us. Tell- um, yeah. So I went up to her. Um, I kind of, so she looked like she was in a lot of pain. I took off her blanket and as soon as I took it off, I saw that she was very, very pregnant as you guys mentioned. Um, and so I asked her what was going on. She said she was having, had been having this pain for a couple of hours and just based on like how rhythmic the pain was, is coming like every five minutes or so. I was like, Oh my God. I was like, she's probably in labor. I have not done OB since third year. Um, but I just started asking her some questions, you know, asked her if her water had broken, it had not, but she had been having this pain kind of the, throughout the whole day. So she was asking for pain medicine and I was trying to tell her that I thought she was in labor. Um, so, uh, pretty much after I saw her, I told the air, the flight, I was freaking out, um, try to, you know, pretend that I was not on the outside, but, um, had the flight attendants look for their emergency kits to spring over, you know, everything that they had. And they were really helpful. They got everything ready for me, brought it over. And then, um, I started, you know, the next step was kind of examining her. So, um, asked them to find a place where I could examine her on the plane. And just and and the reading that I've done, it, it's because I thank God I've never had to experience this. Um, but you've never delivered a baby before, Paul. <laughs> I I've never even seen a baby. It's, I managed to skip over that entire part of my cats. training. Just cats. Just cats. Yeah, just exclusively cats. But in terms of were were you in contact with with the ground medical crew at all? Was that yeah? Was that so, part of it? Yeah, it's because she actually was not a very straightforward delivery. So I was actually very nervous about her. And I had a lot of questions for the ground crew. Um, So I tried to reach them. I had um, the flight attendants, you know, ask the pilots if I could call down. And they basically spent about half an hour to 40 minutes trying to reach down to the ground crew. Finally got a hold of them and told me to go to the cockpit. And I was really excited because I was like, finally, I can ask them these questions. (laughs) I want to ask these OBs. And then we go in there and it's like so much static. And then I hear a way and I was like oh my god they're like Mandarin speaking um <laughs> which I do speak Mandarin I was able to communicate with the patient but I don't know a lot of medical terminology so, so, so wait um, the patient spoke Mandarin the patient spoke Manda- Mandarin yeah mm-hmm um, so this, all of this was, I grew up speaking Mandarin. My parents, you know, are from Taiwan, so I'm pretty familiar with it, but it's not great. So, like I did not know how to say, uh, push. So I just kept saying harder. <laughs> right. Oh my God. <laughs> See, I told you she was a hero. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so I went to try to talk down or talk with the cock or the people who are at uh, the ground level crew, but they were based in Taiwan, I think, because it was, a, it was a China Airlines, which is like a Taiwanese airline. Um, so, but they were not very helpful. They basically told me um, we were still. I, w- I had already told the pilot at that point to divert the plane um, right. because I had examined her by that point. Um, she was in active labor. I have not even examined anyone since my third year of OB, but she was completely dilated um, on my exam. So I told the pilot to divert the plane. And then when I was on the phone with them, I said, you know, I'm trying to get her to land, but it is five hours away. We're in the middle of the ocean. What should I do in the meantime? Should I like have her push or just have her wait? And they said, you know, you got it. Just have her wait. Just keep on waiting. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so wh- who's who's with the ground-based medical crew? I have no idea. I couldn't even, like, figure out who they were. They were not very helpful. They basically said, just wait until you get to... They were like, we'll have a pediatrics team and an OB team ready. Just wait until you can get here. That's all okay. they told me. Great. Um, yeah, just try to keep that baby in there. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. So what ended up happening and and how did it all resolve? Yeah, so um, we ended up, it was kind of a bad idea. I asked asked the flight crew to move her to somewhere. She's actually originally in first class, which, you know, you have your own private seats. 
but there are these huge desks in the way. Um, so you like, can't examine her very well. So they're like, no problem. We got it. We have this area. We can lay her back, lay her flat. So they moved her to the back of the pla- plane in the main cabin, cleared out like three oh seats. <laughs> <laughs> but she was with literally like all of the passengers. So we kind of created this little tent. They put up um, blankets covering like the top of the seat so people couldn't look in. Um, and then the lights were still off. So they're like shining flashlights. And we basically just try to do supportive measures. I looked through their kits to see what they had. So they had um, they had some IV supplies. They had like normal saline. They had um, actually they had umbilical cord clamp this kit did really? and they also had like mm-hmm. that was gonna be um, one of my major questions for you what did you do about the umbilical cord <laughs> yep, rope yep they actually <laughs> they actually did have um, they had metal clamps and then they also had um they also had an umbilical cord clamp and scissors as well so they're pretty stuck the only thing there wasn't a lot of personal protective equipment <laughs> oh, geez. which was really not great um for my clothes, but, uh, yeah. Huh. And then in terms of like gloves, you know, just simple things like gloves, there was, I had to examine her and she had, she had ruptured like kind of a couple, an hour into after I had seen her. Um, so, you know, by that time, you know, you're trying to ensure sterility and you're trying to have sterile glo- gloves, but they ran, they had like three sets and I had a few, but then by that, by the end of five hours, I had completely run out of it. So they're like, they're like spraying antiseptic spray on me. Um, Wait a second. You, you said you had a few sterile gloves. Did you bring some on the flight with you? No, no, no. no. Oh, okay, okay. They actually, had, they actually had a couple pairs in the in the kit. I, I got to say, one of the most telling things about this photograph that I see on the uh, the news article is not necessarily what's happening with the baby. It's the fact that there's this individual who's sleeping at the bottom left-hand corner through all of oh, this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's People amazing. Pretty, yeah, they were actually sleeping through most of the flight. So it was actually <laughs> like, pretty private for or I guess for the majority yeah. until the very end. They're, they're like, nothing um, to see here. Just a baby being born to my right. And how did yeah. how did the mom and baby do? They did great. So um, so the baby ended up coming out um, without a lot of com- like without a lot of complications. Um, she had a great vigorous cry as soon as the baby was out. I was very comfortable. Uh, mom. <laughs> mom was complaining of vaginal pain uh, as to be expected without well. any uh <laughs> without any epidural yeah. did you give her some oh. Tylenol <laughs> yeah I actually did <laughs> <laughs> okay well there we go she was insisting on it and there's like no other pain medicine on the yeah. plane so yeah. I did give her some Tylenol so did, did she name the baby after you no I don't think so okay. no. <laughs> and I heard you 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 dropped mom and baby off in Alaska or something Yes, we diverted to Alaska, and so the flight crew came on board really quickly. So basically, I delivered the baby. Ended up, um, she was basically in labor for most of the plane flight, and then as we were descending, the baby crowned. So then we delivered the baby, and then as it was like the plane was still rolling to a stop, that's when I was like delivering the um, the, the placenta. Um, so right when the placenta came out and everything was like tidied, they actually came onto the plane, which is when I didn't need them anymore. But right. <laughs> well, you, you yeah. meant you mentioned that they had a, an umbilical cord clamp on here. And one of my one of my friends who we've actually had on the podcast, Jeff Colburn, was an EMT. And he was telling me that he was he because my wife's been pregnant a couple of times uh, in the past few years. He said, keep a pa- keep some clean shoelaces in your car in case your wife goes into labor and you have to deliver the baby in the car. Because one of the ways that people end up ha- running into trouble is they forget to tie off the umbilical cord yeah. and then there's bleeding complications. Yeah. And uh, so shoelaces will work if they're make sure they're clean. But <laughs> mm-hmm. it's if you didn't have the clamps, you could have done something like that. Yep, Definitely. So let's go through what is in the, well, first of all, that, that sounds like you, you handled it amazingly because that sounds like a pretty bad situation to be, to find yourself in, especially since you're not an OB. Mm -hmm. At least you have pediatrics, uh, at least some pediatrics training. Exactly. Yeah. I had seen a lot of delivery, so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Cause I'm being perfectly honest with myself. I'm not sure I'd recognize an umbilical cord clamp for what it was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i definitely um we go to the newborn nursery deliveries the complicated one so it was good i had like watched the ob several times so that was good <laughs> well the the things were you doing anything to monitor her vital signs during the do, during this whole emergency here 
Yeah, I really tried to. So I was trying to get like a blood pressure, but I couldn't hear anything on the plane, um, which, uh, you know, I think, yeah, that was a complication. It was just their stethoscope was very poor <laughs> quality, um, you know, the disposable stethoscopes. So I couldn't hear anything with it. So I took like her heart rate, which is like a little bit tachycardic and her temperature. But otherwise, I was kind of just, you know, just trying to monitor her based off of um, clinically how she looked. We will put a link to this article in the show notes. The the There's a New, Medi- New England Journal of Medicine article from t- uh, late 2015 called In-Flight Emergencies. And they have... They have a table in there which has all the supplies that are in the standard medical kit. Now, some medical kits are going to be more expansive, but the the medical kit, it sounds like what you had access to might have, it, it was probably, it was, since it was an international flight, it wouldn't be the same standard kit that you would get on a domestic flight. But the standard domestic flight kit, it has a just manual blood pressure cuff and stethoscope. It has, Can you pronounce that for us? It has... Svigmo manometer. Awesome. <laughs> uh, sounded very almost, medical. <laughs> almost got it. And uh, it so it has it has a uh, just a stethoscope, which is probably not going to be a very good one. It has this manual blood pressure cuff, but as Angelica experienced, and this was actually written in his commentary to the New England Journal article, they really should have an automatic. Uh, digital blood pressure cuff on there because you can't hear the the sounds because the ambient noise is so loud on the plane. And this is, you're not the first person to have experienced this. So one of the other ways around it is you can just uh, palpate a pulse and you can inflate the cuff until you can no longer palpate it. Or if you have a palpable pulse, Stuart, then what's the pulse? Uh, At least 90 systolic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, they, they should have CPR masks in there. Um, they have IV kits and a little bit of saline. They they have they have some pain relievers, Tylenol, antihistamines, but they don't. And they have epinephrine and atropine, but they don't have amiodarone. They don't have the epinephrine auto injector. So if you had to give epinephrine, you'd have to be drawing it up. And uh, they don't even have a glucometer, which is something that I do want to get into a little later. Some of the more common in-flight emergencies. But yeah, it's it's definitely an austere environment. It sounds like you did a great job with what you had available. Thanks. <laughs> what do you wish, if you could take any of that back, what happened? What would you have done differently or what do you wish you would have known? I mean, I think I kind of touched upon this already, but just realizing how not private the plane was and kind of taking that into account, um, it made it really hard to work later on, like when she was actually going into the into late or when she was actually starting to push and like everyone was looking. It was just not a good situation. Um, so I kind of wish I'd kind of taken that into account and insisted that they brought us to the front or something, you know, where it's more private. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing to keep in mind and definitely ask for help. Um, This was not something that uh, was actually a problem for me. The flight attendants were super helpful. They were like stand in nurses, even though we didn't actually, I didn't actually have any nurses on the plane, Um, but they were still pretty familiar with some stuff and they were kind of using some of their own experiences to help um, in terms of having had babies before, (laughs) which actually was helpful. So I think something that the listeners should know, flight attendants do have uh, every two years, CPR and, and BLS training. And also, it's a good idea, like Angelica was saying, ask if there's any other passengers, go wake them up. Does anyone else, is anyone else a nurse or a physician or some sort of provider that can come help you out? And unfortunately, in her case, she did not have good connection with the ground based medical team. But if you're on a domestic flight, the airlines are required to contract out services to some sort of ground-based medical team. And you can really take a lot of the burden off, off of your shoulders because you can, you, ideally you'll be able to get in contact with them and they can give you suggestions because you might not be thinking clearly because you're, you're at altitude and you're, you're probably going to be a little bit scared or stressed. There, there is an AED on the flight, which you didn't need in this situation. Um, but the AED, uh, it, that's the best you could do. If someone, if someone ended up having a rhythm disturbance, you could put them on the, hook them up to the AED and analyze the rhythm, but there's no EKG available on the flight. And I don't necessarily recommend bringing amiodarone and benzos through TSA. Yeah. They probably wouldn't have. 
approve Actu- of that. I bet you someone on every flight has Xanax or something right. like well, that. that. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Angelica, did you think of any of the legal ramifications of helping out? Is that something that you were aware of while this was happening? Um, I was hoping that'd be similar to the Good Samaritan law. So I was hoping, you know, I would be protected from it. Um, but it kind of did occur to me about halfway through that I was kind of beyond, you know, what I, my normal scope of practice, like I'm not an OB. So, um, I was worried about how the delivery was going to turn out and if there's going to be any problems from that. Um, but I felt like there's no one else to help her. So yeah. So I ultimately wouldn't have changed what I did. And if you're, if you're on a U.S. flight, there's something called the Aviation Medical Assistance Act, which has been out since 1998. And it basically says, unless you're grossly negligent or intentionally harming somebody, you're, you're really, you, you should be protected. And that's, that's for domestic flights or international flights from, but that are being managed by a domestic airline. I, I don't, I have to confess, I don't know if, if you were on an airline from Taiwan, I don't know what the rules are there. Hopefully they're similar where if you're, if you're truly trying to do, put the patient's best interest in, in mind, then hopefully you will not have any legal repercussions. Right. What, was she a citizen of the United States? Do you know? Uh, citizen of Taiwan. Ta- yeah. So that, that makes things a little, little bit complicated if a negative outcome then. But I, I think you're right. I think most physicians in, in your shoes would have done the same thing regardless of what the, uh, the law states because, you know, first law is to do no harm, right? So you're going to step outside of your comfort zone in order to uh, provide medical care whenever it's necessary. At least that's the way that I view our role in, in, in medicine in general. So even if I were a psychiatrist, which I am not, but if I were a psychiatrist on an international flight and so, someone went into labor and there was no other physician available, I think it would be my duty to help yeah. out as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Definitely. No, I think that's right. It's it's strange. The only, in the reading that I've done, the only consistent medical legal warning they've made in every review article is very strange. Maybe you guys came across this is just do not pronounce the patient dead, which I just, I, I found, even if you don't get return of spontaneous circulation in the event of a code, that's the one thing you're just not supposed to do on the flight for medical legal reasons is to actually make an official pronouncement of death. And I don't, I, and I don't know what the what the reasoning behind that is, but that's just the one thing I've read in every single article, and I've been trying to research this. Well, I, I, I think some of that may have to do with um, maybe some insurance reasons as well, because if they pass away in an international airspace, maybe there's some, uh, I, I don't know, some ramifications that we don't understand, some type of legal ramifications. But I think if you've if you've done twenty or thirty minutes of CPR and, and coding somebody, and you're and you're exhausted and there's no one else to help out i i don't i don't know what right. the outcome is going to be terrible there so I, I i can't imagine you'd be in trouble for that no 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 i don't think you're obligated to code for five hours but i i do you're not supposed to actually make an official pronouncement of death you know i, I mean you, you can call utility but you cannot make a pronouncement and that's just something they routinely caution against i'm not quite sure i understand the rationale behind it and i hope to never find out uh, it's something to point out for the listeners. Uh, Angelica mentioned she she recommended that the the flight be diverted. It's the pilot will take they will take your counsel, but it's ultimately their decision whether or not the plane will be diverted. And I think probably what they do is they take what the information from healthcare providers on board, plus if there's a ground medical team available, they'll kind of take all those recommendations into account. But ultimately the decision to divert the plane, you might feel like it's on your shoulders, but you're really just a um, sort of a consultant in that, in that decision. You're, you're not the final decision maker. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the, some of the, uh, changes that occur when you're flying and that kind of set up some of these common emergencies. I I think that's how I would like to end is just go over some of the common situations you might find yourself in and how you can troubleshoot these, because I think that'll add a lot of, uh, if, if you're a listener and you find yourself in one of these emergencies and you've heard what you might do, that might help you out in that situation. So, so the big things are people are flying, they're, they're jet lagged, their sleep is off. The uh, environment, the the air on the plane is actually run through the plane's engine, so it's very arid, dry environment, and patients tend to become dehydrated when they're on the plane. Uh, also, a lot of people on planes, uh, you might have noticed, are ordering drinks, so you might be dealing with intoxicated patients, and then just the whole stress of the secure airport security and the check-in process and hustling to the gate, that, that can also cause some problems. Uh, there's decreased mobility, 
So the chest guidelines recommend for high risk patients that they they might wear compression stockings for long flights. Well, I think we're beyond that once we're on the flight, though. You're not going to like, is there a physician in the house? Yes, I'm right here. Here's your compression stockings. No, I just mean if you're, you know, if you're a patient, think about, uh, think about these things. Oh, yes. All right. So the most common in-flight emergencies, uh, according to the uh, some of the review articles, syncope or pre-syncope was one of the most common ones. So, Paul, any thoughts on what you would do in, in that situation if you had a patient who's like pre-syncopal or, or has passed out on the plane? Uh, no, mostly enjoy the quiet, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd wake him up first. <laughs> wake up. But you mentioned one of the glaring omissions is sort of in general, it's, you know, there's going to be variation between what's in the emergency flight kit, but it's, and I do want to talk about alcohol a little bit more, um, as is my way, but with syncope and, you know, pre-syncope, if I think a lot of the places will actually have a glucometer. So even though it's not standard and sort of the default thing, sort of the more expanded kits do have glucometers, that's an important thing to check. So especially because alcohol use and self-medication on flights is so prevalent, that can actually precipitate both dehydration, because as you say, you have that arid error. And then you're dehydrating yourself further by drinking. Or also, say you have someone who's insulin-requiring diabetic, that's going to lower their blood sugars. There's a lot of situations in which alcohol can make things worse and also right. contribute as well. And, and and it's the year 2016. Last I checked, we have a lot of diabetics in this country. So I'm sure somebody on that flight has a glucometer. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And then, you know, we mentioned the benzodiazepines, which, you know, you say getting one past TSA. I imagine that's the most common medication to go through TSA. Um, you combine this with alcohol. I think that's something else would be, be cognizant of for someone who's I, mean, I guess you can get to altered mental status a little bit later on. But for someone who's still feeling woozy, I think that's probably a common uh, cocktail that you actually see on, on commercial and certainly international flights. And and the glucometer thing, you just want to make sure that you're getting clean supplies if you're borrowing one. Cause it, <laughs> but it's not on the standard it's not on the standard kit, and there's also no glucagon. So you might you, I guess you could give epinephrine if you if you really are in a pinch and someone's like hypoglycemic shock, you could you could give epinephrine. Sure, um, sublingual peanuts. Yeah, <laughs> that is I'm not pretty a good sure idea. you're not supposed to feed people. Angelica, does that sound right to you? If they're if they're, <laughs> if, they're if they're if they're in a coma, you probably shouldn't put anything in their mouth, uh, yeah. except for an endotracheal tube. <laughs> uh, but there is there is no endotracheal tube. Just uh, there's just the oropharyngeal airway, which basically is just to prevent the tongue from closing off the airway. But there's no actual endotracheal tube. Right, and w- which surprised me because because there should be an. A uh, nasopharyngeal airway, yeah. but there's not, whatever. Now, if you're seeing your primary care patients and they're asking you about flying, I, I mentioned the compression stockings for patients who are at high risk. The other thing is for your patients with chronic lung disease, you do want to consider what their resting O2 sats are because the uh, on the flight, the, the cabin is pressurized to 8,000 feet, which for somebody with normal physiology who's healthy, their, their P. AO2 will probably be around 60 millimeters of mercury. That means that for someone who's starting out at a lower PAO2, it might be less. So there is something called a HAST or hypoxia altitude simulation test. And the, the, this altitude simulation test can be done. Uh, the pulmonologists at Cashlack Memorial do those for us, and they can tell us if the person needs oxygen and how much oxygen supplemental they'll need for the plane. And there's some forms that you can fill out there. But that is something that uh, I think a lot of people aren't aware of, and it's definitely something you should think about so that we don't create more emergencies that Angelica (laughs) has to respond to. I got to say, Matt, Matt, you've actually (laughs) taught me something. I didn't think that was possible, Stuart. Yeah, Yeah. it happens every once in a while. (laughs) Um. We mentioned COPD. There are uh, sometimes there will be inhalers, uh, albuterol inhalers on the in the standard kit that you can use. Um, one of the other big things that's going to come up is this altered mental status. So, like Paul was saying, people like to get drunk on planes. There's going to be hypoglycemia. You also have to think about stroke and seizure, and, and these are the probably going to be the most common reasons someone would be altered on a plane. Stuart, you got a you got something to say? No, I I just had this mental image of someone getting drunk on a plane, but not in the plane. <laughs> like riding on it, like straddling a plane, riding right, it. Right, like a cowboy from Texas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. Uh, and, and one of the other, uh, I guess there's just two other conditions that I wanted to mention. Anaphylaxis. 
uh, as I mentioned, that that uh, that can happen on the plane. There's no auto injector, so if it does happen on a plane, you're going to be drawing up the epinephrine yourself and giving an IM injection of epinephrine. Or or the the patient may be carrying an auto injector because if they have anaphylaxis, they're probably given peanuts and they probably have peanut allergy. Right. So I, you know, I, first thing I would ask for an, an auto injector: scream at the top of your lungs. And there's yeah, those are pretty common these days. So so that is probably. That would probably be a better solution than trying to draw it up yourself and yeah. drawing up the wrong epinephrine solution. Well, worst case scenario, if you give them too much epinephrine, that you know, I'd rather give them a little bit too much than not not right. at all, right? And and they do have uh, they do have Benadryl or antihistamines on the on the in the kit as well. That that is part of the standard kit. Uh, and then finally, the other there's there might be situations. Angelica, you dealt with this a little bit. It wasn't quite a quarantine, but you were kind of trying to section off a patient. And uh, psychiatric emergencies do come up on uh, on flights, or or if you find out mid flight someone has like TB or something, and you're trying to uh, and you're trying to segregate them, then you can definitely improvise like restraints, or you can improvise partitions and try to get them get everyone else away from them. And I think those are kind of just practical things to think about. But Angelica, anything, anything that we haven't mentioned that uh, that you've encountered on plane flights or that that uh, that would that we're missing here? I've heard. I guess to expand upon the the stroke issue, I've heard that you shouldn't give aspirin on the plane in case they had um, hemorrhagic conversion. So uh, just something to think about too, because you don't know if they have a hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic. Right. Well, yeah, that's definitely a good point. They yeah. they do have aspirin in the kit, so if someone's having a heart attack, go ahead and give the aspirin. But for strokes, because you're not obviously going to have imaging on available to you on the plane. I was going to mention that it's going to be funny, but okay. <laughs> 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 they, and they do have sublingual nitro on the plane too, so you could you can give that if the person might be having an uh, acute coronary syndrome. Just make sure their blood pressure is okay, and you're not going to tank their pressure if they have like a right ventricular infarct, which you really won't be able to tell. Because right. uh, you don't have an EKG, Paul. Any anything we're missing here? Uh, I think we're kind of ready to wrap up. No, I, I think we hit the high points, and I, I think it actually did a fairly shockingly good job of actually talking about the practicalities too. It's particularly mentioned like keeping the patients sort of out of the way, not calling up the aisle, talking to the the ground crew. So I, I think we, I think we did good. Yeah, right. I think people just knowing there's a ground crew and and having some idea of what's in the kit will give them a huge advantage if they ever find themselves in this situation. And yeah. I just, I'm looking at an article right now that actually has a bullet point that says, do not fear litigation. Although physicians have been deposed, no litigation has ever been brought forward against a responding physician. So if that's any comfort. Uh, Angelica, at this point, I usually like to ask, uh, what was, what is your main take home point for our listeners for in-flight emergencies? Um, I think the first thing is, uh, it's a little nerve wracking to be on a plane with no resources, but you definitely have to stay calm. Um, I think, you know, you're definitely the expert on the plane, so everyone's looking to you. So, um, if you freak out, flight attendants are going to freak out, all the passengers are going to freak out as well. So, um, and then just to try to think outside of the box, cause there's not, like you were saying, if you don't have an umbilical cord clamp, try to get a pair of shoelaces um, and asking around the passengers to see what kind of medications they have, if they have any, um, would be good as well. And I think just anticipating things that you might need. So, um, you know, for example, for the baby, I was kind of trying to think of what would, even after the delivery, would the baby need some oxygen? Were there any, you know, little ma- face masks that I could get him? Um, but there weren't any, but, uh, you know, just kind of anticipate complications that might arise. That's great. And I, and I'm still, I think my main take home point is that that woman who sounds like she was, uh, in her third trimester should not have been flying and that would have, but then you wouldn't have learned all these great things about inflated. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you gave us some great book recommendations. You, uh, mm-hmm. you, you taught us about a good, a good medical app and some resources. So this, this has been very helpful to me and hopefully to our listeners. Uh, Paul, Paul and Stuart, did you guys uh, have anything else? No. Th- thank you so much for coming on. It's been, uh, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Thank yeah, you. An incredible story. I can't imagine anyone could have done any better. It's, just, it's, it's inspiring to listen to in all seriousness. Oh, thank you so much. It was fun. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. You can find show notes along with links to any articles, books, 
websites, or apps mentioned on the show at thecurbsiders.com. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Podcast. What books did we recommend today? I want to hear it. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it. I don't quite remember, but it was it was one I hadn't read. It's How Doctors Think. Yes. Ah, got it. Yeah, good job. Nice. Apparently you don't. <laughs> uh, please subscribe to us on iTunes and don't forget to leave us a review. These really help others discover the show and, as we mentioned on prior episodes, really help my self-esteem. That's right. Which is very important. <laughs> so uh, we are committed to providing you, the listener, with high-value, practice-changing knowledge. So please send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. And uh, we've gotten some good listener feedback, so please keep that coming. Tell us what you love or hate about the show. If you wanted to recommend future guests, we always love to hear about that. And you can follow us on our Facebook pages on... You can follow us on our pages on Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, or on Twitter, at the Curbsiders. Until next time... I've been Matt Watto, here with Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. And good night. And this is Paul Williams. Oh, he's still there. Hi, Paul. He's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs>